Real quick, before we get into the show, I wanted to share a new service called Getita that Ken and I have been using that has made us over $10,000 in Amazon reimbursements. The service requires no monthly subscription, and Getita collects a small percentage of the money they recover for you. It takes less than five minutes to set up and works on all Amazon marketplaces. Go to getita.com, G-E-T-I-D-A, and enter promo code FTM400. That's FTM for firing the man, 400, to get your first $400 in reimbursements commission free. How much money does Amazon owe you? Welcome everyone to the Firing the Man podcast, a show for anyone who wants to be their own boss. If you sit in a cubicle every day and know you are capable of more, then join us. This show will help you build a business and grow your passive income streams in just a few short hours per day. And now your hosts, serial entrepreneurs, David Schomer and Ken Wilson. Welcome, everyone, to the Firing the Man podcast. On today's episode, we are joined by Mark Sauer. Ken and I have known Mark for about three years now as we met at the St. Louis e-commerce meetup. Mark is a recovering CPA and a full-time e-commerce entrepreneur. Mark has founded multiple successful e-commerce brands and has been selling online for almost a decade through eBay, Amazon, Walmart, and multiple international marketplaces. Mark's brands have a large catalog of products that he has developed, as well as a recent addition that he designed that has a patent pending. We are excited to have Marcus on the show today to share his wealth of experience with you. Welcome to the show, Marcus. Thank you. It's, it's good to be here. I've, I've been listening to you guys for a while, and yeah, we've, we've known each other for, for quite a while. Absolutely. So longer than three years, it feels like, but but yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So let's start off with, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and your path to being an e-commerce entrepreneur. Sure. Currently live in the San Francisco Bay Area, right outside of San Francisco, um, like going mountain biking. I worked in the corporate world for a while as a, I was a CPA, worked in internal audit and financial reporting, and then made my transition to full-time entrepreneur last July. And it's uh, no regrets. I've absolutely loved it. Awesome. Now I got to ask as a a fellow recovering CPA, (laughs) what drew you to that field? CPA. I'll probably get into it in a little bit, like uh, some of the other factors, but uh, really when you go into a company, if you know the accounting, you can move all over. You can move to a lot of different places, like to leadership, to an operational, to a financial role. So knowing the numbers would be a great way to enter pretty much any kind of company you'd want to and then move around there. That's what I thought. But reality doesn't really doesn't really match that. It's not really how it works in, in the corporate world. Oh, very nice, very nice. Um, over to you, Ken. Let's get yeah, into this. So, yeah, for sure. So, so Mark, can you share with the the audience uh, like how you started in e commerce? Did you first start selling on eBay, or like where did it start? And kind of like, can you walk through like the progression of how that how that worked? Yes, sure. Uh, I was thinking about this, and I first got into e commerce when I was in high school. 2002. So my eBay account's 20 years old and uh, just selling things from like uh, garage sales and stuff. And then, um, you know, back then, like there was no safe, there's no Alibaba, there's no safe way to source things. And so one thing I did is I, uh, I would contact like niche sporting good companies, like rock climbing companies, motorbiking companies, hunting companies. And I just send them emails like, Hey, I love your products. You send me some promotional material. And they send me like tons of posters and I just put those on eBay. Um, not too ethical, but for an 18 year old or however old I was then, you don't really know how to source items. And that was, that, that worked. It, it definitely gave me a uh, money in college too. Spending money. Very nice. Now, did you ever think, you know, three years ago that fast forward three years, you're going to be on a podcast with two random dudes that you met <laughs> at a, uh, at a meetup in St. Louis. Did you ever foresee this happening? No, no, I, I didn't. Um, three years ago, three years is a long time in the e-commerce space. And uh, there's a lot's happened then with my business and macro things like COVID and just uh, supply chain issues. And yeah, three years is a long time in e-commerce. <laughs> I mean, a lot of different things happen. Definitely. I don't think I envisioned it either. However, I have to say that there was a couple of those meetups for you, Ken and I over in a corner going deep <laughs> on data. It was a special sure. connection and it's been cool that we've all stuck with it. And I was great. I would not be on this podcast had I not gone to that meetup. So do you still go to meetups anymore? 
That, that's an interesting question. Um, you know, uh, when I, I lived in Chicago before I lived in St. Louis, and I used that just to meet people when I moved there. And like uh, the e-commerce meetup in St. Louis is great, but and I live in the Bay Area, which is full of entrepreneurs. Meetup.com, like no one's posted in like the big e-commerce groups in like years. And like, these are groups of like 600 people. And I'm too busy to really start pursuing that, you know, being an, an entrepreneur. So I'm, I'm kind of confused. I, I guess WeWork must have ruined it when they bought it. I really don't know. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Mark, so you shared with our audience earlier that you were a professional CPA and then you transitioned to a full-time entrepreneur. So can you kind of like walk the audience through how that went? Like, did you plan for it? Was it abrupt? And any, you know, advice that you would give, you know, yourself three, you know, three years ago? Sure. I, I mentioned the uh, example of like my old eBay account, but then, you know, that kind of petered out. I stopped doing that after a while. I went to college. I wanted to uh, graduate to, you know, a financial role or like uh, work for a big international company, just a lot of different things. But I, I graduated at the worst time you can graduate college in 80 years, at the very beginning of the Great Recession. Um, so uh, it took a while to really get back into the corporate world. And between graduating and getting my first uh, job, was it took a while. I did some traveling abroad. I uh, got a master's degree. I, I could write in many books that no one would ever read about that time period. But uh, you know, having been lagged behind because of the, uh, the Great Recession, I started the corporate world with like a a lot of energy just like to make the time up to get ahead to get what I wanted and I learned really quickly that it's just not how the corporate world works like every time I tried to get a promotion or take on a new project or treasure a new job there's always some uh, there's always someone from the corporate world like a corporate bureaucrat just telling me no for whatever reason and uh after my second job after a few years I, I'm just like okay like I'm not getting any chances here this is it didn't work to even to get a job and now that I'm here it's not working at all like there's got to be an easier way. And so I thought from being a lay person working in the corporate world to becoming an, uh, an entrepreneur, a business owner, where, where do you start from there? What's, what's the first step? And the first thing I did was listen to podcasts religiously, as many as I could per day in the shower and double speed. And one podcast that helped me quite a bit was uh, actually Entrepreneur on Fire, because every day... Every podcast is a whole, it's a different entrepreneur, a different story. So you hear lots of different stories, what people do. And uh, I found that e-commerce was probably the best for bit fit for me because I had lots of experience and connections in China from when I traveled there from, you know, my between years. I knew Photoshop pretty well because I was, I was dabbled in like wedding photography for a bit. You know, I got my, my path there, e-commerce. Where do you get a product from? And, you know, you're bootstrapping this. You don't want to spend a whole lot of money. You don't want to get a course or like buy all this expensive software. I was so desperate really to get a change in my uh, career because it wasn't working out. Nothing was working in the corporate world. So I literally, I'm not joking. I called in sick for an entire week and I didn't tell anyone what I was doing. I stayed in my apartment and just did research on what to sell. And I just sat there, just, just researched it. And, uh, I found that the more time you put into it, you get a lot out of it. The product research, you understand a lot of market trends and you understand like what sells and what doesn't sell. But uh, I, I found a product, you know, it, I would consider it a failure, but that one product, even though it was a failure, made me launch a lot of other products and another different brand. And it just, it just keeps growing on itself and you make mistakes, but um, I guess you just got to start. And that, that was the important part. I, ju I just started and uh, it took um, from my first sale to uh Getting out of the corporate world took about five years, but sometimes it's faster, sometimes it's longer, but it depends on your financial situation and where you live as well and a lot of other things. So let's dive into this time period. So you, you're working the corporate job. It's not all that it was cracked up to be, at least not what you had envisioned. How long from that point in time to taking action into listening to podcasts into like that sick day? Like what, what was that time span? It was about a year and a half, actually. Um, because I remember like specifically, like I got thrown under the bus really horrifically by a coworker. I'm like, screw this, like I'm done. And um, I just, there's this podcast every day, nonstop. Um, yeah, and just uh, immersing yourself into it. You just have to, you have to want it more than anything else. You can't just half-ass it. You have to really go after it. You hear a lot of people saying that like, uh, there are, there's no opportunities, the market's saturated. Well, yeah, that's partially true. But at the same time, there are lots of opportunities out there, but they're not going to be, they're not going to present themselves, present themselves to you. Definitely. Definitely. Now, a follow-up question is something that you said, you had mentioned market research, and this is something that the more time you put into it, the more you get out of it. For someone just getting into this, you know, 
if you spent an entire week on this, what kind of stuff were you doing then kind of as an amateur? And then what would you do now? How, how do you approach uh, market research now? Sure. As a professional? What, what I did is I uh, had two screens. I'd look at this. One would be Alibaba. One would be Amazon. And then I'd also use Google Trends and just like constantly look at new ideas, anything that came to my mind. Like, oh, I'm sitting in the kitchen. Look at the theoretical garlic press and like think of that. But, you know, the best ideas aren't going to be coming from things that you see in your kitchen doing that kind of market research. The best ideas are going to be things you just find random, uh, in my opinion. But what if I were to go back and do it, I would shell out money for a uh, subscription to something like Helium 10 and find like a few free courses online. Or I think Helium 10 offers one. I'd spend some money. You know, when you're starting off and you're in a paycheck, you know, every two weeks, you see like, oh, one, an $87 subscription is a lot of money. It's X percent of my paycheck, you know, and you think of it that way, which is not really the way to think about it. So you, you do need to spend money on some things, very targeted things up front. You can't be completely frugal about this, but at the same time, you guys spend money, just not too much money. Yeah. I like that advice about not buying a $5,000 fake. <laughs> so, so Mark, so you've went, you've successfully went from corporate job, corporate America to full-time e-commerce entrepreneur successfully, by the way, and that's congrats. That's, that's really difficult. And so, Thank you. It, yeah, yeah. So for someone that's listening to the show, what kind of advice can you share with them on like, what should they be focusing on during that transition? If they, if they want to, you know, go full-time, like what are some things that they, sh- they can focus on to help them out? That's a good question. I would say that time management's a pretty serious one. Cause like when I started this, I was, you know, I was single and like, I could put throw time as much time as I could possibly into this, like say it really late, call in sick for a week. It's hard to do. I mean, if I was to start this now, you just can't become comfortable. Like I've got some friends that say, Oh yeah, that sounds cool. I'd love to do it. But they, you know, they have to go through their nightly routine of TV shows, go to bed at this time. And, oh, I don't do any work past this hour. Like, you can't do that. Like, if you want to succeed or get ahead, you have to, like, make sacrifices. You have to really want it. So, and, and podcasts would be a good thing. I mean, like, you know, as I said, just you want to listen to podcasts, other people's ideas and what they did and what works and what doesn't work. Yeah, just try different things. Uh, so, uh, so keep, keeping this conversation going about advice and, and firing the man, let's go back to your last day. Like what? So y- you started this journey five years ago. You have now arrived. Tell me about that day. What's going through your mind? What do you do after? Yeah. T- tell me about that day. Well, it's just uh, just pretty much ready to go to the next step. And I um, mean, you know, it was time. Everything was, was working. It was hard to leave the corporate world because... I uh, live in the Bay Area, which, you know, isn't exactly the cheapest place. It's probably the most expensive on earth. But, uh, you know, there was just so much momentum and just the corporate world was getting into it. Like, it was just getting in the way every step that I did. And then, like, you know, here I'm, I'm managing a few employees at night. And then I'm going and doing very low-end things, like, with my corporate job. And it's like, this this can't work. This can't last. And, um, yeah, as soon as I left the corporate world, it's just uh, everything it fit in perfectly. It just, uh, it, everything fit in terms of responsibilities. It is a struggle too with, I mean, cash flow because you're used to getting a, uh, a steady paycheck when you're in the corporate world. But like when you're in the business world, your perspective changes because, or in the entrepreneurial e-commerce startup world, because it's like, oh, I could be getting a paycheck or I could be reinvesting in this or that. So, I mean, it's a balance. That was one of the bigger challenges to find that balance essentially between like going from a steady paycheck to like actually having to pull money out of the business. So that was, that was one of the bigger challenges, I would say. Yeah. Some really, really good advice and uh, definitely uh, I feel you on, the, on those challenges. Let's pivot a little bit into uh, product development. And so you've got some really unique products that solve problems. So without sharing like, you know, the nature of the products you sell, can you share with the audience and what motivated you to to create and develop these products versus just launching an Alibaba Me Too product like other sellers do? Right, that's a that's a good question. Um, you see a lot of people that are so desperate to get into this. I mentioned before how like you have to really want it, but that doesn't mean go and buy like a thousand like hooded sweatshirts, baby baby towels, which is like they, what they talk about. They talk about in podcasts is a go a go to Me Too product, like don't do something like that. You got to, if you, your first product, you have to be some, you have to, uh, so my, my first product was an apparel product. And I, I noticed this, something that was popular at the time on the train in Chicago, actually. And I'm like, Oh, that's a good idea. I'll do that. And so 
that product was a failure, but it launched going along with that trend. I launched like, I think a hundred other products like that, like uh, different kinds of products. It's different kinds of apparel, other little accessories. And um, yeah, it's just one by one. And what was it? And I had no one teach me what you shouldn't, shouldn't do. So none of these of this first brand was no product was like a runaway six figure a month product. They were just doing, every product was just doing okay, which was great in that there wasn't a lot of competition. So not much in terms of PPC costs, but it was hard to scale because you got all these different products. You're just making an okay amount of money. And then about a, about a year after I launched that brand, I was visiting my parents at home and my mom was complaining about a problem she had in the house. And she always complained about this since I was a little kid. It's not unique to our house either, but I was thinking there has, now that I've got my e-commerce product research hat on, like there's gotta be a, a solution for this. And uh, I, and I looked on Amazon, there was not a solution for this problem. I'm like, oh, wow, this is good. I really didn't, wasn't using Helium 10 or looking at other, like uh, comparing other sales, but none of this, nothing like this existed then. And I started at that point really diving into how to get this designed. And it was going to take an engineer and injection mold with, and I had to figure out with plastic and some other components as well. And so starting off from square one, a lay person who knows nothing about injection molding or engineering and designing to releasing this complex product that took like over four years. And that, that was a hard product because in the meantime, I found out that this problem, there's easier, simple solutions. This hard product was still a solution, but there are easier solutions too. And I tried that out and the easier solutions just took off immediately. They sold so quickly. What was funny about this is the easier solution. It wasn't a new product. It was just a repurposed product that there's a million different listings for on Amazon. I just repurposed for one usage and it just, it just took off. And I was able to make lots of different variations from that, the, the cheaper one, and like different sizes, colors, different components. And it's, yeah, I can, I can talk about, uh, about that a little more. I really like that, you know, that you solved an everyday problem by, <laughs> by creating a product and launching it. So, yeah, can you dive into that like, a little bit more? Like, are you doing that more with your other brand, like with your other products? Are you, are you just finding problem, everyday problems and then developing solutions and launching products based on that? Well, it, it, that's hard because like, like, for example, you go on Shark Tank, for example, everyone's like, oh, here's a problem it solves. And like, I consider this to solve a lot more of the uh, problems you see in Shark Tank. The problem is because it's a common product that's repurposed, you can't, you can't uh, patent it. Like, it, there's no way to patent it. So it's just, it's pretty much the strategy there is to launch. I had to learn this too. I didn't learn this straight off is to launch as many variations as you possibly can um, just so it's impossible to, to catch up with you. Cause like this one product is gonna have like 30 different variations at the end of the day, um, starting in March. And like for someone, for someone trying to catch up or like a Chinese, one of the many Chinese who try to copy me, like it's, it's, they can't do that. It's gonna be impossible for them to like copy 30 variations and just like, cause they're not gonna know which one is the sales. And, um, and it's gonna take a lot of capital to get all the variations captured together. And so I'm pretty much just giving like uh, customers at, at Amazon, like no reason to go to another listing besides mine. I like Over that. Uh, I really like that. I think the typical Amazon seller, if they're being honest, they have failed product launches. Like I, I, and I think it's probably over 50% personal products I've launched are over 50% of them just don't really pan out the way I, I hope they do. And so whenever I hear injection molding or mold costs, I get nervous. Uh, <laughs> I, I feel like my risk is going up. I like to go play at the $5 blackjack table meaning low MOQ. And now you need to go to the high stakes table where you have this element of uncertainty. So can you talk about that? What does that look like? What lessons did you learn as you were going through this? And also comment on your CPA. Some people would say you have no business doing injection molding or figuring out types of plastics. So like talk about that figuring it out. David, I'm glad you mentioned the old gambling thing because when I lived in St. Louis, I, I dabbled into gambling and I, you know, I, or poker rather, not gambling, nothing. I only did poker, but 
you know, losing my first hundred dollars in poker. And then I'm, I, I got into tournaments and from a $10 ticket one time, I literally, I literally want a ticket to the world series of poker, $10,000 ticket from a $10 tournament. And so you go from playing with like the locals and the local casino and to like the best in the world. Like I had, I had that at the time, the highest earning poker pro in the world ever sitting directly to my left. And like, yeah, you're at a different table. You're at a different risk, but you just have to adjust your mindset to it. That mindset is the most important thing. Um, that's, this was one example I have there. Uh, you have to really validate the product. You have to really understand how everything works. You have to, uh, you have to understand that like there is demand for it. And you have to like, what I invested there at that time in the, the business, I knew pretty much if it completely failed, it would not sink me, but I believed in it a lot. So you hear about all these like modern day business failures and that's because they bit off more than they can chew. Whereas the correct step is to take baby steps, but only like, like with gambling, only play with what you can afford to lose. You know, I, I bootstrapped a lot of it. Like for example, the mold in a, if it was made in the U S for example, it would be around $60,000 versus in China, it was less than a third of that. And you order like a, the correct MOQ. So it's not too much stuff. I ordered a little too much in this time. And, um, and honestly, my, my first run with the mold had a lot of issues. They didn't really do decent QC at all. I thought because they were sourcing from, they would. Some of the components had issues too, which were just as bad as a QC. So there are all sorts of problems. And so literally from the first run of this injection molded product, I'm probably, I'm probably going to lose some money. It's not going to be a loss, but I'm definitely, it's not going to be a profit, which it's fine because every single problem that was discovered, it's been fixed or getting fixed. So we're, we're making this, the second run is just about to get shipped out right now. That's awesome. And yeah, like, I think it's crucial to like share the, the missteps or the obstacles that we all face to with everyone else. So, you know, right ahead, like David mentioned, if he hears mold costs, he's freaking out like, Oh <laughs> crap. Like, and, and so, you know, like what you're, you're explaining Mark is that, you know, there's going to be problems. You are just going to work through them and, and continue to, you know, uh, make new versions and improve. And so that kind of leads me into my next question is, so Mark, you're one of the people that I know that like, uh, improves products like consistently and very well. And so, um, which I think is crucial to, to like the longevity of a product and also to like differentiating yourself. I know some, some of your brands have, have been attacked by Chinese competition over the years. And so you're, you're always like, I'm making mine better. I'm doing this. I'm doing that to differentiate. So can you share with the audience, like a couple things that come to mind on like, when you have a product, like, how are you going to make that better? How are you going to differentiate it? We can pick a random one, like a baby towel or something. And, but like, what are kind of the steps that you, that you kind of go through to, to see how you can improve a product? I would say, um, I just launched a new product. I just tried something new with this one because I didn't just launch it in the US. I launched it in Canada and England at the same time. And this product took, took a while. Like I had a, an employee just like kind of look down this niche, kind of do some sourcing and we couldn't really figure it out. And so looking at competitors and all the competitors had, first we looked at the competitors for a similar product and a similar line to my best brand. And we noticed a lot of the reviews were 3.5 to 4. And they're all... For all the competitors, they had the same uh, issues, essentially. That it was crap. It was junk. And they really made it sound like it was something more in the in the listing. And I bought one, and it was complete junk. It was, I can't emphasize, like, how it was so deceiving. And so there's there's many better ways to do this. And so I read the reviews. I did sourcing. I looked at the different pricing and just looked at different alternatives and how much they were going for and their velocity. And then I'm like, this is good. This works. But... On top of that, like, you know, Amazon, between when we started and now, Amazon's been completely, like, uh, saturated with Chinese sellers. And when they, when they find money, they go at it aggressively. And, but they they don't really take chances. They don't really do new things because they, uh, that's just kind of the way things work in China with, from education to, like, entrepreneurship. They want to see it, like, that, like verified, or uh, they want to see the, the revenue stream that it's there for competitors. And so, yeah, you look at all those things about the demand of the product and you also look at the listings, like some competitors listings, they'll be like, it'll literally have be sold by Amazon literally and have one product image or like the foreign listings will have like awful grammar, like Photoshop hell, just like, they, they just look like junk. <laughs> it, and then you think is like somebody who's 
you know, based in America who wants to do better, like what can, how can you improve that the overseas com competition can't do? And so you put your face into it. You know, you say that you're an American company, you, you say a brand story, you talk about your brand, you talk about your company, you talk about the mission statement, talk about your history in the, in the past. You uh, don't, you use Photoshop absolute minimal. Like, like for example, uh, for the a theoretical, like, I don't know, blender in the kitchen, like a high level, high quality listing is going to have someone in it, like a real person in it, maybe with their kid, but like a foreign competitor listing will have like, it'll just be Photoshop hell. It'll just be like someone just completely Photoshop in there, thrown in there with bad grammar. And like, who do you think the like typical American customer wants to buy from? Like you, you have to like take those things into account if it's going to make a big difference. Now, my next question, it's two parts and still going along with product research, product development. How many, we'll call it like prospects, like ideas, are you evaluating for every one product launch? I'd say probably, that's a good question. I'd say probably five, five ideas, five ideas to one. But a lot of those ideas I can combine together. Okay. Now yeah. my, my next question is, so you kind of, you have your idea bucket, right? And, and I kind of think of it as the top of a funnel and then you work your way down to identifying the best product. And with you being a retired CPA, I would imagine there's some analytical numbers-based rules that you're applying or metrics that you're looking at. And so can you talk about that? Basically the, the spreadsheet math behind, do I launch this or not? Is this going to work or not? That's that's a really good question. I mean, for a lot of the products I launched, there were no competitors before and they became very popular. So you can't really do that. You can't really take a textbook approach. You just have to kind of like fill it out. There are several products that I've launched even like in the past couple of years that year that like you don't think you're going to be popular, but you just order enough for you like, I'm okay losing them. So once you validate everything else that like there's, there could be demand that this is popular, but this is close enough. And this sells and the competitor sells for that much. You kind of got an idea how much it is, but you also for risk management, you kind of just, uh, you buy anywhere from, I do this for new products, anywhere from like a couple hundred to a thousand, depending on the price. And uh, sometimes they take forever to sell out and they're not really a failure or success. Other times it's just like, I'm ordering two weeks later, like a brand new batch, like huge. So there's no real, for me at least, there's no real uh, equation to this. It's just kind of like, it's it's risk management, I would say. Because you also have to factor in too, like how much time it's going to take to get pictures and to make a video and PPC. But you just, you want to get a gut feeling of as much information as possible from whatever source you can, not just helium 10. Yeah. I, that's interesting too. Cause like, I don't know that I've ever launched a product, like a product that didn't exist before. <laughs> and so, yeah, I mean, like you're right. Like there's, you, you can't like go and look at competitor, like, you know, pricing and all that. I mean, you have a rough estimate of like fulfillment, you know, cost of goods, things like that, but sales velocity demand like there's no if, if it's a unique product that doesn't exist on the market there's no data for it and so i like that approach where you're ordering enough to for a market test i would say you know hey throw it out there you know is it going to stick or is it going to fall off the wall and and then you go from there so i like that it takes a lot of finesse like that i i, start, I said this before i can't stress this enough for anyone listening who wants to get into this don't take something there was a, a million variations of and launch it and think it's going to be the same it's 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 you want to differentiate enough where people are going to care yeah absolutely let's talk about i know you've launched a, a product bef uh that's unique we've talked about a lot of these and one that you've filed a patent on and so you've went down that that route that journey and so can you share with the audience like what are some things about patents? And then like, what does it look like from, you know, kind of from start to finish of your journey? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question too. That's a whole different world. Um, this is kind of the tricky thing. And like, I was fortunate enough to be lucky about this. And this is for anyone listening who's thinking about that, just to remember that you'll talk to patent lawyers who um, from big firms who want to make their numbers, who want to get numbers better. So they might tell you just to patent something, just patent, just spend the money on us to patent it. But a lot of times you don't need patents. I mean, that it's, it might be hard to protect it or someone might not want something from a patent exactly or might find it valuable enough to copy it. Um, a lot of times people want patents is, well, because of investors and like investors that if you ever want to sell the company, it just sounds really good, that's patented. Because like this product, which is really unique, with the startup costs and like launching it, 
it would be hard for a competitor to really like launch it in there with the exact same design and catch up in terms of reviews and like and quality and everything. Like, I mean, that's kind of the truth. Like uh, for a lot of products, there's and there's some things that like my most like I said my most popular products you can't patent because it's it's already a common product. But I decided to get my my injection molded piece patented because I mean it was so much money just to to put in there and I it was going to be a blockbuster product, and so I wanted to get a nice patent too. And there's two kinds of patents. I'm not an expert on this, and it's been I applied for this in January, so it's uh it's been a while. Uh, there's a design patent, which is cheaper, faster. It's pretty much, you can't, I, can I understand you had an issue with this too at one point. Uh, it's pretty much, you can't make this exact design, but from what I understand, you can slightly change the design and it doesn't violate the original design patent. Or there's a utility patent, which means it's uh, the utility of this product or how it's, the, how it's really made or manufactured. You don't have a claim on that. Um, you or you have a claim that being unique and it's good for 20 years. It's pretty much just building a moat around a product. Um, and so a competitor of mine brags that, like they brag that, oh, patented, patented, patented. And I, I looked at their product and it's patented in Europe, but it's not patented in the United States. And so people use that a lot of times just kind of brag about it. I mean, I honestly don't think if I didn't patent this, there would be a lot of um, competition for I don't think anyone would violate this. I think it'd be very hard for someone to violate my patent. It's just, it's for investors to like, um, for investors, I want to get outside investment or if I want to sell the company, I'd say. Um, and it takes a while to, to get to. I, I looked it up just yesterday because like I said, I applied for the patent in January and uh, I haven't heard back from them yet. It takes a while for them to uh, to re review it, but uh, I expect in the next year or two, I should, I should be getting it. It's not, it's a little longer than a trademark. Would you do it again? Knowing what you know now. Actually, I, I, I can't really say that because I, I'm relaunching my, my Blockbuster product and it depends. Once you release a product to the market, you have, or it's publicly disclosed from my understanding. I'm, this is not legal advice. I'm not an IP lawyer. <laughs> You've got one year to file a patent on it before um, it becomes like, you can't do that anymore. And so... I would launch it. I, I would I would line up my product launch with public disclosure. So day one, you're launching it, public disclosure. Try to get see how well it's going to sell. And if it's selling really well and you think there could be people making a copycat product, I would I would definitely patent them as soon as you could. Otherwise, I mean it's uh patents aren't cheap, you know, twelve thousand bucks minimum, ten to that twelve thousand bucks plus extra fees if there's an office action from the USPTO. It depends on much profit you think you're going to make from it from the life cycle and just kind of how big you're looking for this product. Did you go through an attorney or an agency? I went through an attorney that my friend recommended. He was it was interesting because he pretty much told me a non-BS answer. Like you're not going to get the same thing from a patent attorney who's who can make a lot of money off of you versus an independent person. You want to try to get an independent figure because they're they're a, a patent company, the company a law firm that specialized in patents are going to try to sell you something a lot of times, even if you don't need it. So it might be hard, but you want to try to find someone who's going to give you free advice. Um, and this friend that this lawyer that was recommended to me initially, he went back into private practice. So he referred me to someone and they specialize in patents and uh, yeah, took it from there. A couple of follow-up questions on that was now, so you had mentioned uh, your range for your patent was about 12 grand. Was it a utility patent or design yes. patent? It was a utility so, patent. Okay. Design so patent's a lot cheaper, but there's just not a lot of more protection on it. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so utility patents, definitely like the higher end one where it, where it protects you from like functionality, where like, whereas a design patent, someone can just sidestep it with just a, a different, a small little change to it or whatever. So yeah. And then one last question is, so you mentioned it's been almost a year now. Now, did they say what's the standard time for, for it to be like completely, you know, I guess, active or, or completed? Was it like two years, three years? I don't remember. Like I, I looked up last night. <laughs> I looked up, this is probably from the podcast, but I, I looked up last night on the email to see where I was at. And I hadn't heard from them for a while about this. I am looking at another patent for another product actually right now that I'm designing, which is similar to that, the original product. But um, before you apply for a, a patent, 
is you want to make sure that uh, your product's solid. So I didn't apply for it until the design was, was solid. And if you're getting a 3D mold made or an injection mold made, you want to get a 3D print. 3D prints, you want it to make it get it as close to the plastic that you possibly can that you're going to use. And you want it to, to function perfectly. So I'm designing something right now. I'm on the third 3D print. And uh, I don't, I mean, I have to make sure the design's good. Because if the design works, I'm probably going to patent it, pat, make it another patent. But there's uh, there's going to be some more work to make sure that actually the design's perfect and there's no more flaws to it. That awesome. seems like a really practical approach to to this whole process. And it, it kind of makes it a little less intimidating. Right, right totally. But um, like you talked to a lot of like IP law firms, they're like, oh, just send, send a patent, send a patent. But I'm like, from learning for the first time, I'm like, no, absolutely not. I'm going to make sure my design is perfect before filing a patent. Um, because this new product I'm making, I don't even know if it's it's uh, the design is going to work because I'm trying some different things. It's risk management. Cool. One question is, so the products that you have now that you filed a patent on, has anybody tried to knock you off? No. People, no, it'd be hard to knock that off. But uh, they, there's like me two products that are somewhat similar and they're just complete junk. And you see that in the reviews and what people say about them. And very nice. Well, that was, that was really helpful in terms of, of uh, the patent process, the injection molding process, and really a neat story. I think a lot of people, the first thing they do is, is go to, to launch that me too product. And I think a lot of people probably get burned out early on because it's just an uphill battle uh, when you are launching the hooded baby towel that has a thousand other sellers. And, and so I think that's, that's really neat. And, and it's cool to, to see somebody execute on it. So now Marcus, what, what do you have in store over the next 12 to 18 months? What, what do you, what's on the horizon? Sure. That, that's a great question. I am planning on last in the last year, I've expanded to England and beefed up my presence in Canada. England, I know what the demand for my products are going to be in Europe. So I'm expanding to the rest of Europe, uh, Germany, and France, and I am expanding to Japan. So the goal is to slowly make products that are going to be bangers. No, like, prop, I'm not going to release any products that are just going to make a little bit of profit, just going to be okay. Focusing on, on a high income pr- products that I can not just launch in America, but globally all at the same time. Like I said, my last product I did, uh, you can really make a lot of gains that way. You can get, get ahead quite a bit. And on top of that, I'm trying to build out a B2B segment where I would sell my products to uh, different companies and government agencies. I actually just had the, someone from the Marine Corps reach out today to fill out a, a form 899 before they buy some of my products. I don't know what they want to buy yet, <laughs> but uh, not just use Amazon, but go, B2B, because you're going to get bigger orders, bigger margins, not have to pay all the fees and PPC as well, less competition. So that's my real goal for 2023. Expand internationally and go business to business. Awesome. And what about beyond that five, 10 years down the road? I'd like to get into more technology heavy things. I mean, I, I live in Silicon Valley. People here, they're more like, they're used to taking large sums of venture capital, making a software as a service thing or some app or something with discussing profit margins and just running with it. So as I kind of expand my, I guess, e-commerce and just like B2B, I'd like to keep that in mind. Things that can act, act like a ways to involve more technology in my products, things that can have a scale up faster, have a bigger technology footprint. So that's kind of going to be what I'm, I keep my eye on for sure. Very nice. Very nice. Well, I'll tell you what, one of us, one of the three of us is going to have a seven or eight figure exit in the next couple of years. And we all need to go to Pat's Tavern in Dogtown, Missouri, (laughs) where it all started and celebrate. That was, that was the starting point of uh, great relationships that have have lasted this long and and will into the future. So over to you, Ken. Yeah, absolutely. So anything else we want to cover guys before we get into the fire round? All right. I think Mark, we're ready to go. Are you ready uh, for the fire round? Yeah, yeah. Shows go for it. All right. What is your favorite book? My favorite book. Uh, I'll give you two books I'm reading right now on um, the corner of my desk. One's The Extrapreneur's Playbook. The other one is From Zero to One by Peter Thiel. Okay. Excellent. What are your hobbies? My hobbies. Besides working my business, I've got a two-year-old son and I, uh, I like to mountain bike in Northern California. It's uh, absolutely amazing to do that around here. Really cool. 
what is one thing that you do not miss about working for the man? Good performance reviews about people having to give you bad feedback just because they have to give you bad feedback. It's like, you're doing great on everything, but you forgot your TPS report. So sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I totally agree. All right. Last I, I, I could, I could expand on this, this question for hours. Yeah. But. Yeah. Oh, oh, gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> What do you think sets apart successful e-commerce entrepreneurs from those who give up, fail, or never get started? You have to want it. You just absolutely have to want it. You have to be willing to get up at whatever time or go to bed whatever time, and you just have to really want it. There's there's lots of options out there. Just don't give up. Try something new. Uh, lots of people have done made this path before out of the corporate world. You just have to focus and try new things, keep innovating, but don't gamble everything at once use risk management, but you just have to, you have to want it. You have to try and keep trying new things. Awesome. Excellent advice, Mark. Yeah. Marcus, I want to thank you for being a guest on, on the podcast. This has been just another awesome firing the man story. Somebody who, who recognized that they weren't happy in corporate America and they started investing in themselves in learning and they took action. And there's a lot of people that don't take that third step, which is, which is the action part. And, and it's really cool to, to hear your story and watch you develop over, over time. So you guys as well, it's, uh, it's been an interesting journey seeing us start from three guys with like corporate jobs to uh, in a working or meeting at the tavern to, uh, to right now. It's uh, it's quite a transition. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. All right, Mark. Uh, thank you for coming on the show. If people uh, want to get in touch with you, what would be the best way? Sure. I would say either LinkedIn. Uh, my name is Mark Sauer, M-A-R-C-S-A-U-E-R, or through Twitter, uh, which is Beached, B-E-E-C-H-E-D. That's my handle. Very nice. Very nice. Thank you. And look forward to staying in touch. Before you go, we wanted to share a new service that Ken and I have been using called Getita that has made us over $10,000 in Amazon reimbursements. The service requires no monthly subscription, and Getita collects a small percentage of the money they recover for you. It takes less than five minutes to set up and works on all Amazon marketplaces. Go to getita.com, G-E-T-I-D-A dot com, and enter promo code FTM400. That's FTM for Firing the Man 400 to get your first $400 in reimbursements commission free. How much money does Amazon owe you?